Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Jubilee Church, everybody online. We just love the Lord, and we want to worship him this morning. Um, I heard a story that I thought was really significant. And this, this young kid was asking his dad, Dad, how big is God? And so they were outside, and they, he, his dad pointed to a, a plane up in the sky. And the plane was going by, and he says, you see that plane? Is that big or little? And the boy says, it's, it's really tiny. So he took him to the airport. And then the, they, they were standing right next to a 747. He says, now how big is that plane, son? And the son says, well, it's huge. And the father said to the son, well, you know, your perception of God and how big he is depends on how close to him you are. And so we, as, as we worship this morning, let yourself draw close to the Lord and see how big he can be in your life. So we're going to start out with uh, our call to worship with our shofar. How great is our God. He's greater than you can even imagine. Hallelujah. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will sing how great, how great is our God. Sing that again. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will sing how great. How great is our God. Sing it again. Yeah. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. Is our God the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty? Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our god well sing with me how great is our god and all will see how our God, an age 
to age he stands Time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son The Lion and the Lamb The Lion and the Lamb How great is our God Oh, sing with me How great is our God And all will see how great, how great is our God. You're the name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will say, Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will sing how great, how great, and all will sing how great, how great, all will sing how great, how great is our God. of our praise you are great and greatly to be praised hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah You know, in Revelation chapter 5, John wrote that every creature in heaven and in earth and under the earth and in the sea and every creature, all the angels, thousands of thousands are singing this song that we're going to sing right now. And so, close your eyes. Well, if you close your eyes, you can't see the lyrics, right? So, just imagine in your heart and visualize all of heaven and earth singing this to the Lamb. 
and the Lamb is entering the throne room to take his place on the throne. And we are joining in with all those hosts that are singing this song right now. They're singing this song right now in the heavenly realm. So let's sing. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor. Glory and power. Glory and power. Be to him who sits on the throne. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor. Glory and power. To him who sits on the throne and to the land forever and ever and to the land forever And wisdom, strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches, and wisdom, strength. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor. Glory and power. Glory and power. Be to him who sits on the throne. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor. Glory and power. To him who sits on the throne and to the land forever and ever and to the land. i 
riches and wisdom, strength and honor and glory. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom. And wisdom, strength and honor, and glory. And glory. Yes, Lord, you alone are worthy to be received honor and blessing and glory, Lord God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Praise. Praise you, Jesus. Who shall 
our voice and give them a praise. Thank you, Jesus. Glorious King, you have made victory in submission. You have become obedient to the Father in death. And now raised victorious and glorious, triumphant. You are our high priest, our King. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. Worthy, worthy, praise Jesus. What a blessing. God has done it for us in his son. We have life. He who has the son has life, eternal life in the son. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just welcome your presence, Holy Spirit, to reveal Jesus, our high priest, seated at the right hand of our Father, making intercession over us, causing us to enter into the fullness of salvation. We praise you. We thank you for this day to be together. We thank you that we can engage our heart 
encounter our God and change from where we are into the glory where you are. Mm -hmm. And we praise you for that moment now. This chance to be in your assembly, in the place of your glory and presence, to provoke each other and encourage one another into love and good works. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you. For the provision the Father you gave us in the Son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Oh, what a gift. What a gift. What a gift. What a gift. Well, you may be seated. Just what a gift he's given us in the Son. He who has life. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. He who has the Son has life. If you have the Son of God today, you have life, eternal life. Wow. Sometimes we just have to shift because we come in from where we were and we've got to come into where he is. Yes. And it just takes a little bit of making an intentional shift because where you are is not where you are. You are where he is. He went to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. So he's intentional that we would... But it's a funny thing, the word place is it's a seat that you have when you're occupying it. But if you're not occupying it, it's not usually doing any good. <laughs> so that's why we do the praise and press in. That's why we pray. That's why we proclaim. That's why we testify and declare his name. Because we're, we're making it intentional that our mind set itself on the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and our life is hid with Christ in God. And before we go too far, we just start going, well, that's where I am. And all the stuff I'm trying to alter or fix or resolve or undo, I don't even need to worry about it because I'm up here where he is at the victory in the triumph and his joy. Amen. And that's praise. That's prayer. That's proclamation. That's the confession of hope. That's why we put our mind there. Hallelujah. So now... We'll put our money there. It's time to give. It's time to share our offerings. I think I got a report. We got about 30,000. It's come in this month, and we're halfway into the month. So bless you for giving, being faithful. God honors the tithe. Actually, he commands the tithe. And he taught it, by, taught it to Abram in promise, and then it was canonized by Moses, and then Jesus reiterated it in his journey. And what it does is it brings us always first God, God first. And I don't know about God. He's got a weird thing about put me first and I'll take care of the rest. Put me last and then you take care of the rest. And so that's what this, it's like praise. It's another form of faith, submission, trust, movement. So if you'll help me today, I'm going to pray just God will turn our hearts toward him. We'll hear his heart will respond and then we'll give and then we'll offer the whole of the tithes and offerings Amen. to the Lord okay dear Heavenly Father I thank you that we can be a family that we are a family and we can press in and tighten our our space between one another into oneness and union and that we can bring our whole of our identity there with praise with worship and we can bring our whole and financial future together with tithes and offerings. And Lord, we ask you to just receive us right now and show us if we're asking you about offerings, how much to give, if it's about tithing, faith to respond. We praise you. We praise you. You're worth it all. You're worth it all. You could have been a God that said, give me 90% and I'll have you live on 10 you said, give me 10 and I'll make 90 become 110, 120%. Mm -hmm. You're a God of multiplication. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you and we praise you in our giving right now. We raise our faith in our God whom we're giving to. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's worship and sow our seed and give today. Yeah, Father God, this morning we just declare your strength, God. We declare your strength in this atmosphere, God. You're the strongest one in the room. We worship you, God. We worship you. Jesus, our Savior. Jesus, our Redeemer. Jesus, our Intercessor. 
the great high priest. We adore you. We bow before you this morning, God. We give you all of our heart, God. We just lay it down at your feet and we lift up our arms and we just declare you alone are God. To the one who wore the crown of thorns, to the one who took the lash and scourge for the hands and feet that were pierced by nails. The sacrifice that has torn the veil. Oh, we crown you, we fall face down and we worship, we all cry out. His very life away took upon himself all our guilt and shame hanging on a cross for the world he loved with his precious This man for God, and we crown you, we fall face down, and we worship, we all cry out, you are worthy, God, yes, you are.
Jesus, you are a high priest, and you've been seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting for your enemies to be made your footstool. And there you receive our tithes and offerings. And we give these freely and willingly, with faith and expecting that your help will make up the difference of what we've given and overtopped 10%, 10 times amount, 30 times amount, 100 times amount, your ability to multiply comes upon this giving and tithes and offerings in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Blessing. Well, before you're seated, go find at least three or four people. Welcome them into the house of God, to family, to love. Uh, and then we'll reconnect. We want to say hi to everybody online. We love you. Thank you. Good morning, good morning. We're so happy that you are with us here as we're celebrating Jesus this morning, our King, our High Priest, the only one who is worthy of our hearts. Yeah, and he is the one that's with you and is with us. We're one body, and <clears throat> one spirit, but many locations. But expect the Lord to come to you this day, wherever you are, because we're getting ready for the coronation to celebrate the Pentecost and the, and the beginning of the harvest that's closing to the age. So prepare yourself to, for the Lord's uh, resurgence. I just yeah. feel he's coming with a, a yeah. greater sense of his purpose and glory and baptism of the Spirit. It's as though we're here on earth. And we're all just feeling that expectancy and that excitement that something's just about to happen and break forth into our atmosphere. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, everybody, come on in. Find yourself a seat so we can just uh, 
Couple, three items. Parents of junior high and high school, parents of middle school, high school, there's a quick parent meeting after service in the youth room. So please, uh, Mike wanted me to remind you of that, Mike and Kristen. And then I got a video. Would you go ahead and put that video on? We have a video from kind of a promo for our parking lot party next Sunday that came out of our last Memorial Day picnic. Hey church, what's going on? Okay. Hey church, let's get in. What is happening? Where did he go? I'm ready. Hey church, what's going on? Hey, Jubilee. I want to invite you to the Pentecost parking lot party. 28th of May, Memorial Day weekend. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be right here in the parking lot. Come on to church. It's going to be so much fun. Yes, we're going to have free tacos and horchata and obviously a piñata, piñata, piñata. We're going to do games, fun things for the kids. Free tacos. Games for the adults. Free tacos. Churros. We're going to have uh, live music. Peter Michael's going to be our DJ. So we, it's going to be so much fun, and we can't wait to see you there. Come on out. <laughs> I feel like I was a little bit of the top. All right. Please make sure, you know, grab, a, grab one of these little cardboard invites and let your neighbors know, let your friends know. It'll be starting right at noon, and it's going to be this next coming Sunday. So please want everybody to get in on that. And uh, the other thing, praise night. We're going to do praise this Wednesday. We've been doing prayer all the way since the begin, two weeks before Easter. Every week we've been praying, praying, praying. Now we're doing another night of praise. So 6 o'clock, 7.30, this Wednesday in preparation for Pentecost. So love for you to uh, plan and help us be a part of that. And I believe that's it. Praise you, Jesus. Okay, I want to... Um, this last Friday, Jesus ascended to heaven. I mean, if we were in the original first ascension. Caught you off guard there, didn't I? I didn't even see it on the news. But it was on a Friday, and he, was, he ascended. And I want to begin in chapter, Acts chapter 1, see if we can position our heart. I love what um, the Bible is a, a script. That's why we, you know, scriptures, it's our script. And if we take it as a movie and we begin to see it, we can, with the little help of the Holy Spirit, we, we get placed inside it. And if we get placed inside it and behold, that's meditation. Before we realize it, we start to believe it. Where we couldn't believe it before, we didn't have the, the grid for it. So the, the, the post positioning, imagining, looking at it. And we started in Acts chapter 1. And I've been in that since uh, Easter. And let's just begin in verse 1. I'm going to just find my place in the Bible so I can keep up with jumping a few scriptures. How many would like to have a new Pentecost? Yeah? You know, it says, we'll see in a moment, they were in one accord. That means one passion. They were not indifferent. They were very intentionally positioning of the heart and we'll, we'll talk about that but that's I believe is this week is a perfect week to get into that anticipating uh, the all feasts of the Bible were to be celebrated to commemorate what God had done or was yet to do and therefore we can re-experience what he has done and we can step into what he's going to do and they're 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 
there, there were set appointed times. And so Pentecost is the fourth feast called the Feast of Weeks because it was count seven weeks plus one day from the first fruit, which was the third feast, which is the one we don't hear much about, but we know it was Jesus' resurrection. You had the Passover lamb. You had then immediately began the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But because it was in an agricultural society, the farmers were waiting for the first fruit of the crop, of the harvest. So that first fruit, they would then bring to the temple to worship. And from that day of the first fruits, the next Sabbath or the next Sunday, they counted uh, 50 days, which brought them to the uh, seven weeks plus just another Sunday, which was then called the Feast of Weeks or the Pentecost. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, the first fruit, he then spent 40 days with his disciples, training them into the things of the kingdom of himself through the Spirit, and then sends, and then on the 50th day, the harvest begins, the coronation of the king. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to just let, with the help of the Holy Spirit, release a vision for what has happened and what is still happening. So, dear Father, I thank you for the help. You really knew what you were doing, Jesus, when you were told through the Father to tell us that it was expedient for you to go so that the Holy Spirit would come. And the promise that we are to celebrate is coming, which was to make you famous. And so, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and recreate for us, release within us, remind us, guide us, and show us, and announce to us this morning everything that Jesus has. And Jesus said, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, he, Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and announce it to you. We're welcome. I want to, I'm ready for the new announcements and the renew and the returning of announcement. The, re, the whole idea of repentance, break it open in our lives in this service, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So Acts chapter 1, the former account I made, O Theopolis, <clears throat> excuse me, of all that Jesus began to do, both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. That was the book of Luke. After now, here we begin the book of Acts. Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. Through the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Jesus was doing everything in a new way. He was doing everything through the Holy Spirit because he was training his disciples how they were going to be led by the Spirit and how he would be communicating with them through the Holy Spirit. Because we will see in a moment, he has a new job. And it's right at, and he has a new place that he has to occupy, which is a throne with the Father at a right hand. So through the Holy Spirit, he gave commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. The two most important commandments that we embrace is that we believe on the name of the Son of God, Jesus, and that we love one another as he gave his command, to love as he loved us. Then he uh, also, through the Holy Spirit, presented himself alive. And you say, well, how do you mean through the Holy Spirit? Well, he never was recognizable in the natural until the eyes were opened. Then they knew in the Spirit that this was a resurrected Christ. Now, one appearance of Jesus from Easter through the, you know, the end of the Gospels, which we have the records of them, does ever, whoever he's appearing to, recognize him to be the one they knew before because he's this new creation. And it took, takes the unveiling, the removing, the receiving, and his voice, Mary heard his voice, knew it was a rabbi when she, he called his name. The uh, guys on the road to Emmaus recognized later in hindsight that when he opened the scriptures and spoke about himself, how their hearts burned. John figured out that that's Jesus who told him to put the boat, cast the net on the right side had to be Jesus because of the kind of harvest they just got of the net. So it was, there was a correlation for revelation. So it was through the Spirit, presented himself alive, came alongside and said, hey, I am really alive, which he still does today, right? Every time we kneel, take a moment, set ourselves apart to pray, he comes alongside to reveal himself through the parakletos, the Holy Spirit. And then 
he also uh, spoke to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God through the Spirit. <laughs> because we know today, thanks to Paul writing in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if you want to know where the kingdom is, it's in the Holy Spirit. The other, the other place the kingdom is is inside us. That's why we're not trying to recognize outside to see if the kingdom's coming. We have to let the kingdom of God appear from within. So it says then, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. That was a, like an order of stay here, not, not the commands, the, the, the charges of the king and the kingdom and the essence of who he is and where we are. But this was just stay here. Uh, and wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the endowment of power was coming. Luke said, don't go anywhere until you're endued with power and high, then you can proclaim this repentance to remission of sins. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? I'm, I'm encouraged when I see the apostles because he told them, he was teaching them about the kingdom and he had, they didn't have a clear clue yet really what he was talking about. They were thinking still of a geopolitical realm of reign. And are you going to do this for us now? And he says, not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father's put in his own authority, whether I am or whether I'm not. It's not for you to know. That's not your focus. Times and seasons, chronos and kairoses, because that's the Father and his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. So the purpose of the coming of the Holy Spirit was to give power, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. And it's a witness that enables us to declare the gospel at the face of all hostility and troubles and struggles, even to the point of death because that's where the witness became such a synonym to many who would give their life and their testimony that it comes from the Greek word where we get the word martyr. So I don't like to say that, but he said, you'll get to have power to be a martyr for me in Jerusalem, which is today present Jerusalem, in Judea, which is the region, the district that surrounds, it's the territory of the tribe of Judah, Samaria would be what we know today as the West Bank and going up along the Jordan and then into the end of the earth. So it's like everything starts from within and goes without. Now when he had spoken these things, and here's where we want to get ca catching up with the new moment. While they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, First off, when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration and they were beholding the conversation of his departure, his death, with Elijah, Elijah and Moses, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Now, I, I just don't think it was a regular old cloud of the sky. It was the cloud of the glory of the Father. And it received him out of their sight. And I know that because... Ezekiel talks about him coming in the clouds, returning with the glory of God and the power of God. So this was some really moment. It wasn't just like an elevation of up there. No, I can't see him because he's behind the clouds. No, this was being received into glory out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he went up, and uh, as he went up, two men stood in white apparel, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will soon come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Which is, is really great. That's why when we see the troubles on the earth, we're supposed to look up. Because our redemption's drawing near. We're supposed to be looking up. That's where our inspiration comes from. That's where our strength comes from. And they had an event. This was very important. We call it the ascension. We use the term ascending to the throne as to someone 
we just witnessed the coronation of King Charles and that whole event after 70 years of not, you know, it just was incredible things like that. But this was, this was something that was never been before. And they were the first privy of what was coming. So if you allow me, if you'll step in, would you, let's just stand up and gaze into heaven for a minute. Let's just gaze into heaven. And, you know, we, we don't get to see him leave, but we're going to see him come. We're going to anticipate his coming. So, so in the midst of life, you can look with your eyes open, you can close your eyes, but with your uh, inside of your eyes, look and see Jesus coming. See them coming in the glory of God, in the power with his angels. See him coming like the brightness of, the cl- of, a light, of, of lightning that flashes from the east to the west. See him coming on a horse with, his, with the two-edged sword. See him just coming and to, 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 to receive us, to receive us. And if you can, see the fact that we can see into the place where he sits so we can sit with him because we've been raised with him and are now seated with him. So not just f- feet on earth and head in heaven, see ourselves seated with him in the heavenly places. All that was accomplished in the Son is now ours in Christ. And we can step out of the conflicts and see ourselves seated with Christ in heavenly places. Praise you, Jesus. It's very important where Jesus is when you pray because he's really only one place now. It's right next to the Father. And he has all authority and he's interceding. Oh, praise you. Oh, we praise you. We praise you. We see you. We see you. We see you. Okay, amen. You may be seated. Whenever I pray, I pray to my Father, and I see Jesus as the provision of my salvation, and I come to my Father through Jesus, and, and I don't ever see anything other than, than what the Bible describes is where he's per, per, presently working from. Uh, the throne is really important. That it, it denotes all of the authority. It denotes all of what has been accomplished. And we'll keep going and we'll, we'll catch up with some of that before today's over. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day of journey, which is, yeah, just when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. Most likely the very upper room they had the, the Passover meal. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There was about 120 of them. So they continued with one accord. One accord is the word passion, same passion. They were, they were in the same passion, and they were in prayer in that and supplication. Prayer is a posture. It's a movement. It's toward God. It's, 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 and supplication are petitions. So they were praying what Jesus had been saying. They were positioning themselves to, Lord, we want to receive what you promised. We want the power that's going to come. We don't know what that means, but we're here. We're intentional. We can't leave until the power comes. That's what you said. So we, we're positioning. We're waiting for you, which is always a precursor to every new thing God brings. Is there's a hunger. There's a recognition of the lack of our own resource that could accomplish the will of God. There's a, desire, there's a directive that starts to say we've got to hold our place because God's got to enable us to do the new things so we don't have it. You know, it's not just, gosh, 120, 130 years ago, the church was trying to touch the Holy Spirit and the baptism and the speaking in other tongues. Prior to that, it was believed that the baptism of the Holy Spirit came with what we would call the baptism of sanctification. It was like a second consecration. It's like giving yourself really wholeheartedly to the Lord. 
And they felt that that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there was no speaking in tongues, and there were no real the demonstrations like they were longing. And people caught the idea that, no, we need that speak in other tongues. So they began to tarry for that because that was the last instructions they had been given or Jesus had given to receive the Holy Spirit. And the tarrying was a part of faith for that, at that season. Now today we know that if someone has the Holy Spirit, we can pray for someone else to receive the Holy Spirit. And faith of the person praying usually is enough to bring the other person straight into the baptism and they can start speaking in tongues, bang. But back then it, it, it could be a very, uh, there wasn't un, as much understanding, but there was much more intentionality and passion. Smith Wigglesworth, who was at the turn of the century, a great evangelist, faith, faith person, uh, he would say, I would rather have five people on my platform or one person on my platform who's seeking the baptism and has not received it yet than five people who are sitting there content in what they have. Because it's the hungry, it's the, those in seeking that are the ones that get filled and the ones that, that attract God. He comes to those who are diligently seeking, not just casually visiting. So there, that's one of the things you can tell in your own, I can tell in my life when God is coming to me for purpose and to us, there begins to be a hunger and a thirst and, a recce and an anticipation. So I think those 10 days of prayer were electric. I mean, electric. Because Holy Spirit was present. He wasn't like, oh, I've got to sit up in heaven until you send me. He'd already been given in the breath of Jesus at the resurrection. He'd been present with Jesus as Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, was giving commands. And he was over the chaos of the earth in the very beginning when the earth was without form and void. And he was hovering over the, of the darkness until God said, light be, and Jesus became, the word became light, and the Holy Spirit demonstrated what the word became. God said, God, the word became, and the Holy Spirit demonstrated. So Holy Spirit's always the first guy in the mess. So he's in our mess right now. It, it, really, is, it, it really is a part of, again, recognition of truth versus recognition of facts. Facts can say death's everywhere, things are in bad mess, nothing's going to turn right. Spirit, truth, can begin to say, whoa, you feel the Holy Spirit? He's so present. He's so ready. You could be looking at the chaos and the confusion, or we can be looking at the, whoa, there's someone brooding over us. Do you feel him? He's, he's brooding. He's brooding. He's just brooding. And, and yet the war is real. Conflicts are real. They're, they're sorting out what do we do. We've got to, what do we deal with about Judas? He's, he, he betrayed. He's lost his apostleship. We've got to find another apostle. They resolved that. And then 10 days into the uh, this days of prayer, they come to Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, please. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. 2-1. Thank you. And uh, in one accord in one place. So that one accord, they'd continued in prayer. They'd, they'd, they'd be intentional. I mean, again, you, we, we've got seven days, eight days to practice prayer right now. Make it a fresh prayer time. Just make it a fresh. Just, I'm hungry. I want moo. I don't want to. I don't have enough. I don't know about you, but I don't have enough. To, to, to meet the challenges of today and of the pressures that are growing and of the Father's will that none should perish but all be saved. And I saw so I'm, I'm, I'm in a desperate place and I'm desperate to see all that Jesus has received as an inheritance to be fully his and all the ends of the earth to be fully his. So I know there's more to be fully experienced. So we're... We're doing that. And that's what this Wednesday is going to be, another day of prayer. Love for you to come hungry and passionate. I don't think 
Again, it's not about praying the right prayer. It's about believing and leaning into and, and desirous of, and then getting to that moment where something within clicks with the words of truth and the Spirit of God and the action, and you go, it's, I want it. I'm here. We're here. And, you, and it just then it comes that suddenly. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Everything originates from heaven. John the Baptist even said, a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. And suddenly came from heaven a rushing, mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. We've been taking this last two months and praying through the entire church every Wednesday so that we don't leave any room or any closet or any office or any prayer room or any classroom un visited. First we were sanctifying and cleansing and applying the blood as Ezekiel 45 said. Now we've been listening and, and declaring what we're hearing God saying and what he wants to do and we're, we're, we're like that posture because I believe when God comes he doesn't come just to touch individuals. He comes to a place where he's gathered individuals. So he's ready for a oneness. A, uh, an, an immediacy that, that could, could, could multiply. So when it comes, it fills the whole house. First, it filled the house. So if, if you could imagine something of the, 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 the power that was flooding the place they were, then the next thing that happened was tongues of fire came. There were divided tongues, so they're, they're just fireballs. Glory fireballs that are just. And next thing, one of each of those, each one of those, one of those each found a head to sit on. And just, you know, it just, it, it, they each tongue of fire, verse three, please. It, it went back on their heads. It sat on their heads. It sat on their heads on each of them. I believe there's two things happening there. A, we're making a transition from a physical temple to a people out of the temple. So the fire is over the, those who are where the Holy Spirit's about to abide and dwell in. And I also think it's because the first thing God needs to burn up is my thinking. Renew my mind from, from, from my limitations. So all of a sudden, you imagine we're sitting here watching fireballs land on people's heads and they're not burning their head up. They're just burning over their head like the mount, mount, the burning bush. And they're on them. And so then they, immediately, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled. Sat on all of their heads. The whole house. All the heads. All filled. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we've learned... I've learned this, watched it happen hundreds and hundreds of times, is that I will share when I'm praying for someone for the baptism to speak in tongues, I'll say, we'll declare what the scripture says, and we'll make it our prayer. Father, fill me, I received Jesus, the Holy Spirit. I asked that I would be able to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives me the utterance, as he gives me the ability. And then... So I know that it's the ability is going to come, the utterance has come from the Spirit, but we'll start speaking. So we're, it's a concert. We're both working together. I'm not, not, there's times people, I've watched people just totally be overwhelmed and just gushing out. And there's others that are super self-conscious, super you know, processing, and, and, and having a hard time because it's, it's too much mind and not enough trust. So we'll, we'll, we'll follow the, the next picture. It says they were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. This was not the unsaved getting saved. This was the saved getting saved. This was the first move. The first move of God is always upon those who already know God to a, to a level or a degree but, and are, are devout or genuine. And now he wants to come and bring them into a new place. And when that sound occurred, and that sound is now the multiplication, it the multitude, they came together, and they're confused, and they're because they all hear them speak in their own language. So they were amazed, marveled, and said, "What could these? Look, these are all Galileans. We, they're, you know, they're, they, how, they don't know our languages. How can they speak in our own language where we we're born?" And then it lists 
all of the places they've come from. Jumping ahead, uh, verse 11, it says they are hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. I don't know why they use wonderful works, because it seems like you're disconnecting from God. And if you look it up in the Greek, it's the magnificence of God. They're viewing God. And if you allow me to be excited, in the reading of the Bible in the Jewish calendar, on however long that's been going, at this coming Sunday, they will read Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 is the vision of the glory of God and the Son of Man seated on a throne. And these guys would have read that prior to the event because they had started on Saturday. Now they're reading. Now they're seeing. Now they're experiencing this, this fire. And that's what Ezekiel saw. It was a firestorm. And now they see the Son of Man. And so what are they doing? They're going, you're the Son of you Whoa, you're, you're glorious. You're, you're magnificent. You're wonderful. You're full and powerful. Which is why I always try to get everybody to praise. I always try to get you to praise because if you don't praise God, he probably won't he'll go right by you. But if you will engage praise and start lifting up, and all of a sudden he'll rise up within you. I don't understand it. But I know it to be true. I, that's why I, I just force myself. I don't ask my flesh how I feel. And I don't ask my soul if it'd like to get involved. I just say, we're here. And this is what we're doing. And raise those hands and shout and say and praise and engage. And always get loud. Louder than your thoughts. Stronger than your emotions. Shift the, shift the battle at the gate. The gate of the mind. And so they're all of a sudden declaring it. So if I'm working with someone trying to get them speaking in tongues, and they're kind of going, I'll say, let's do this. First thing we're going to do is praise God. Let's just start praising him. Let's just start praising him in our native tongue, in our English. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you that you're our Savior. We thank you you're our Deliverer. We thank you that you're our Redeemer. We thank you that you're our King. You're our Healer. Just anything and everything that we know him to be. And then I'll say, now stop speaking in English and now open your mouth and let him fill it and you start speaking out another language. And nine times out of ten, that's all it takes for someone to feel comfortable enough to say, well, I'm not going to be so thought, what is, how does a word form? How do I get these thoughts? How do I come up with this language? They just start, their, lang their mouth is moving. They've asked the Holy Spirit to come and now... They want the but utterance. The next thing you know, you're ahead of you. You 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 lost. You're kind of outside of control, and the tongues start flowing, right? And and then I'll do the always to everybody after they're speaking in tongues. Encourage them. I'll say, let's all. We're going to practice. We're going to stop. And then we're going to start. All right, everybody, stop. Start, and we're back and forth until they learn that speaking in tongues is theirs to choose as often as they want or as little as they want. You, won't, you, you will be able to have say over that gift, as really all the gifts, because you can back out of any of them if God starts to manifest, and you're going, not, not, not me, I'm not going there today. Uh, so they were all amazed. They're perplexed. Whatever could this mean? They're going, whoa. And then some are mocking. There's always people there to be going, whoa, something real is happening. Others may be going, that's stupid. That's just, they're just drunk or something. So G Peter gets up and says, these men aren't drunk because this is just 9 o'clock in the morning. We don't start drinking till at least 5. I mean, this is the Jewish community. They drink their wine with their meal. It's just early in the morning. You don't really find as many people drunk at 9 in the morning. So he's just using a simple logic. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So let's again, and then we're going to take a moment and experience this. Let's see why and what was this glorious Holy Spirit doing and why was, and why was this the scripture to describe what was being done. He says, it'll come to pass in the last days that God will pour out of his spirit onto all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. 
And so that, so, so you, you notice, we will notice that in the gift, in the coming of the Holy Spirit, it all involves the eyes and the mouth. To see and to say. Because that's where all testimony of the kingdom comes from. It's what we see and what we say of, of heaven. So they're prophesying. Kings, sons are prophesying. Daughters are prophesying. Young men are seeing visions. Old men are dreaming dreams. I dream more dreams than I used. I see visions now. I'm getting old. But I also enjoy those moments as much as a, a vision. And on your men servants, on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. So what I've termed these, this phenomenon and its result is, I call it, hilarity to clarity. You know, worry never brings a vision, except the terror and the worst happening. But worship often opens the heavens to see more than what you're doing, what you're praising over. So, and hilarity is just, you just, it's just something about how God likes to say, come on, guys, lighten up, relax. I've won. I've got the victory. I'm the king. I'm the Lord. I got a control. I, we're in. And you, you get those moments. And if you've ever been in those seasons where the laughter of heaven really starts to take hold of you, it, it frees you from all the worry. If, it, because you can't, you can't laugh by... By in, in, as a dispense, as a dis, as a a, 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 an, a a way in which you're to approaching something and worry at the same time. But if he who sits in the heavens shall laugh, God is not worrying over the world. He's laughing. He's laughing over the stupidity. The, the ridiculousness of kings and princes plotting together to, to take off the cords and, leader and, and, and rule of God and cast them behind of the Lord and of his anointed one. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. And laughter is really a powerful thing. When the Lord took me back in 2011 out of, into a whole other place of learning to abide and not try to produce, he taught me that whenever I was to see anxiety or fear or frustration or want to control something, I was supposed to just laugh. And I had no sooner heard that word than I was in a, we were in a conference and the service was going and somebody was dancing, running across the front and they got too close and almost hit me in the head and I was about frustrated and I heard the Lord say, laugh. So I went, ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he, ha, ha. And, and really, but then all of a sudden the joy came and because I had opened the gate, it flooded. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm, re I'm not only laughing, I'm re realizing the ridiculousness of my sense of control or responsibility. Or, and for, from that moment, it became an immediate door into the truths of this heaven that God wanted me to learn to submit and, and live in. And I would sit and laugh for hours every single day. Everything was funny, and the mo funniest thing was me. I was the funniest thing because I'd look at myself and go, I can't believe I thought I could do that. I can't believe I thought I could do this. How would I ever be able to accomplish that? Who am I? Go, ah! And it was just like it lifted so many struggles. And that's why I believe the church began with a party. Jesus' ministry began at a wedding. And his first miracle was to multiply the, get the more wine. And don't you think, I promise you, we will not be hiding under the kitchen table saying, oh God, please save us. We are going to be in hilarity, even if it's on our way to death. Because, it's, because we are stepping out of the limitation of the natural world and live, is stepping inside the unlimited eternal kingdom that we're a part of. And the Holy Spirit's the one who does that. He's the one who can move us out of the realm of where we're being 
suffocated into the place in which we are being elevated. So the hilarity brings clarity. But it doesn't just do that. It brings the proclamation of the glorified Christ. So in verse 20, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Okay, I gave you a reason why we're acting so, so drunk. But here's the reason we are so drunk. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to, by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as yourselves, you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You know, we're all going to pick up a cross, and we're all going to go some, through some stuff we didn't choose. But I want to say that you'll never go through something that God hasn't already predetermined purpose and foreknowledge to bring about something that's going to be glorious. Nothing. The problem, why it's so hard to see, is that he was taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. So God's sovereign purposes are being executed in our lives according to the Scripture and by the Spirit, and yet lawless hands are often the instruments of facilitating us into our next place of victory. And that's really dis disturbing because you think, no, I, th I think we just got to get rid of the lawless hands. But if you don't have lawless hands, how do you get crucified? And if you don't get crucified, how do you take away the sin of the world? You go, I don't need to take away the sin of the world. Jesus already did that. Well, yes. But it also said those who are stronger to bear the weaknesses of those who are, uh, the, bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. And we're supposed, you know, and we're supposed to lay down our life. And laying down your life is our soul. And I have to lay down my soul. And I have to know when, how far I can lay it down before it's taken from me. And when it's being taken from me, I have to take it back and put it in, back in the hands of God until he gives me enough renewal that I can go lay down again. And when we're suffering with Christ, it's so that we can learn to hear under Christ the words so that we're not held captive by this world in the fear of death. So there's a whole lot of suffering going on for the greater glory of God in the earth through his living church. And I'm here to say, time to claim the glory. Time to say, well, Lord, I'm not trying to get out of this. Come on in. Come on in and make this a feast in the presence of my enemies. I've got to walk through this valley of shadow of death, then let me have the rod and staff to help me along. Don't let me stay here. Keep me going. Keep prodding me. Move on. Get up. Don't die here. Get up. Let go of your own issues, but keep pressing on. Follow me. So now they're declaring whom God raised up. It was God's predetermined plan. Lawless hands put him to death, but God raised him up because from the pains or the power or the control or the birth or the, 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 the vortex of death because it was not possible he could be held by it. Because he had, the power, he had now the power of an indestructible life. This was not like some, oh, do you think we can get enough power to get him out of hell? It was impossible to be held. He could not die. He's had an indestructible life. He's been called into a new creation, a life-giving spirit. So now the resurrection is to prove that God accomplished what he had set in motion when he put his son on the cross to be my sin offering, our sin offering. And now that sin has been fully dealt with, Jesus had submitted to the Father in full submission, trust, and he believed that God would take him out of death. And so God said, that's faith, son. That's faith. That's like the faith of Abraham that believed that his son could be raised out of the ashes. But that's the faith of the son who could believe his father would call him out of death. And now if any of us believe God did that, he says, that's all that you ever have to do to be imputed with righteousness. Nothing you can ever do can be righteous except to believe what I did to my son, not just that it's becoming sin, but his resurrection. I brought him out of the abyss. I called him to be my son. I called him, you're my son. And if we believe, righteousness floods. And we go, okay. There's something about, this, this is so important. And 
he goes on and he says, David said, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. And he wants to make a point that Psalm 16 was a prophetic picture of a promise made to David's seed according to the flesh that he would not allow him to see decay. He would call him up out of the abyss. And he, so they're using a number of scriptures, a number of scriptures to substantiate that the resurrection was prophesied, which is why praise is so powerful, because if I praise God, I will soon prophesy. You can't not prophesy when you praise. Because if you start making God big, God gets bigger. And if you start saying God is great, God becomes greater. And before you know it, after Thanksgiving, you start praising. And after praising, you start prophesying. Look at the uh, Song of Moses, the only song that we know gets into the, into the heaven. They start singing about the victory they just went through, and then they start prophesying to the land they're about to inherit. Because God's always going so much bigger, which is why I think Satan works overtime to put a cloud and shroud of depression, discouragement, despondency. I don't feel good where I've got to take my phone and flick it a few more times if I can find something to make me feel good. So I'm entertained. I'm engaged with some... Well, God's saying, you're seated with me in heavenly places. I want to give you a vision. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you a breakthrough. But you won't look up. You won't lift up your voice. You won't praise me. So we're in a conflict. We're in a conflict. And there are all those moments when God says, it's time to break past the conflict. I've got enough receivers on this location that once they receive, they'll go with me. And if once that go with me, then they'll mul that'll multiply because they'll all be able to recognize what I'm doing. And it's to raise up Jesus. So they jump ahead. Um, verse 32, real quick. It says... This Jesus, this Jesus, the one who came out of the grave. Because if you'll allow me, just again, we just read through these things. Like today, Romans 8, it's all about. But Romans chapter 1, can, can, Barb, can we do? Uh, verse, the first six verses. This is the gospel in a short version. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be apostle, first a servant, then a calling, separated to the gospel of God. So God's gospel, God's good news, which he promised, God promised, through his prophets, all the ones that were before Jesus, in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, present relationship we hold, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, the son of man. God the son became the son of man. This is something that he was in total submission. He was walking in, the, in, in, in a relationship of absolute dependency to God and trust. And, and he had to pray. If he didn't pray, he wouldn't be able to sustain his position of, of union and community. He would have been overwhelmed. That's why when he was on the Mount of Temptation, he was praying. And that's why after he finished the testing with the devil, the angels came to strengthen him. That's why when he was in Gethsemane, he was praying. And that's why the angels came to strengthen him. Because this was in the flesh. It's all about in the flesh. He had to do what Adam didn't do. He had the advantage of not knowing sin, but he had no advantage of God's virtue, position, glory, that just was his without faith. Everything was faith. Everything was believing. So that's why when he's in the garden and he's saying, God, I would love to get out of this, Father, if there's any way, Abba, Abba, Abba. But nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. He was submitting unto the voice, under the word, and he was learning this obedience through the thing he was going through, off of what was happening. And he was now submitting to the Father to become the sacrifice of sin. But he believed that God could raise him out of the dead. See, all it takes to change the season is to not change the circumstance, but to change the outcome in your prayer. 
Don't try to change the outcome. I mean, I have spent years trying to fix things. Have you ever, you know, like Mr. MacGyver in prayer? A little duct tape here, a little bubble gum there. You know, you, I've always seen change when I go, Lord, there's nothing for you to pull me out of this in a resurrection, in a victory, in a triumph, where it's impossible for death to hold me. I know you can call me out of death. <laughs> Thank you for calling me out of death. That's where I'm, that's the apostle, that's, I'm looking for that. He, de he was declared to be the son of God. The new birth that he was the first to experience was with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So all of a sudden now we know him as the son of God. He was in essence the son of God always, but he had, he had identified and emptied himself to be the son of man. Now out of the resurrection, he's, everybody knows he's the son of God. And he's been given a, from the dead. Through him we've received the grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all the nations. So back to Acts, verse 20, uh, 23, 22, 32. This Jesus, this resurrected Jesus, this Jesus that we were just with, Ten days ago, this Jesus, the one we just proclaimed to you that you've heard about. So Acts chapter 2, verse 32. This Jesus, God has raised up. The, the new creation, the life-giving spirit, the first, firstborn from the dead, not the only begotten, but now the firstborn among many brethren. A whole new creation. This Jesus, God raised up, in which we are all witnesses. Then he goes on, therefore... Being exalted to the right hand of God. I never see Jesus anywhere but there. Now, it doesn't mean he has to sit on a seat and can't take a walk. I'm, not, I'm talking about it's not just who you are. It's where you are. You can have, you, you, that's the position you hold is more than just the person you are. It's an authority position. It's a position of total authority at the right hand. Psalm 110, Psalm 2, the, first, the most quoted psalms to substantiate the gospel message through in the book of Acts and through the epistles. It says that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Hashem, or Jehovah we'll say in the, in the English, said to Adonai, to my Adonai, sit at my right hand. We call him now our Lord and Savior, Jesus Messiah, our Lord and Savior. He said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Lord will send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So he's not passively waiting. He's intentionally moving things by moving us in the spirit and prayer, proclamation. So it says, this Jesus, he's exalted to the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's why, to me, this is the coronation. Pentecost is when the Father has now commissioned Jesus, high priest, Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace. He's made a vow. He's sworn to him by an oath. He didn't swear that oath to him while he was walking on the earth. He swore that oath to him when he went up to heaven and he took his blood into the, the tabernacle not made with hands. And he cleansed the entire heavenly realm for access. And he made it clear through this exchange that this was one offering for all sin for all time. And there would, this now would be the boldness by which we could approach God. And it was through the veil of his resurrection. And it was in his high priestly ministry over the house of God. So these positions were really important. They're really important. And we, we often, I think, miss a lot because we don't take the time to learn this. Israel came out of Egypt. And, you know, some will say you could go from where they were to where they were to go into in 13 days. But it, w it was impossible for them to get into the promised land in less than two years or within two years. And the reason is the first year was to try to get a, 
a temple, a tabernacle worship in place. So a nation could have identity with God and God could have identity within the nation and dwell with among them. And while the 40 days of, plan, of, of, of God giving to Moses the Ten Commandments and all the patterns and plans of the tabernacle, Israel gets so swept away with fear and where's got Moses, we don't know what's happened to him, we need to have something familiar, let's build something with our own hands that we can say is God, and then we can say this God is the one who took us out of Egypt, and now we'll have, we'll have, we'll have, we'll have a party, but not the right kind of party. And so it was a training mode. God, God is in the beauty of holiness. And yet the only way we can approach God's in his full holiness is in Christ. It has to be all about what you have accomplished. It's all about what you've done. That's why your blood gives me my boldness. So he was doing something. And when he receives the Holy Spirit, he says, I've yet I, on chapter 2 of Psalm 2, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That's not the one on the, in, near Jerusalem. In Jer it's the one in heaven. On my set my king. I poured myself out upon my king. He sits down. He says, here is now the libation of Holy Spirit. Here is the promise. And here I pour him out. Jesus receives him. And it says, he poured out that which we see. He pours out the Holy Spirit. And now that he pours out the Holy Spirit, he goes on and says, David descended to heaven. He said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, Psalm 110, out till I make your enemies your footstool. And so, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made Jesus, whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. This is a lifetime discovery we can have. There's no limitation. None of us have to qualify except accepting Christ, believing in our heart God raised him from the dead and confessing him as Lord. But then we can have access. We can do the Roman Hebrews 10, 19. We can come into the, boldly into the presence and the holiest of holies and approach with the true heart, have our conscience, our, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our body washed with pure water, come alive in a confession of hope. Every one of us have been given that unction, that charge as priests. That's why we're known as kings and priests. We're supposed to go and be with God in agreement with Jesus and, and, and step into that realm of, of oneness, of what he's accomplished. I agree with what God the Father says about my Lord the Savior. I agree with Jesus Christ that he has been both healed and delivered. So I am healed and delivered. I am redeemed. He was raised from the dead. So death has no longer power over me. I don't have to... It's, we're identifying with this high priest. And the good news, and I would take us there, but we'll, we don't have time. But in, that, in Hebrews chapter 7, we get a really, really good picture of Jesus' high priestly ministry. And it talks about an endless life, that he has a power of an endless, indestructible life. And because he's ever living, he's able to save us all to the furthest of his intent as we come to God through him. And as we come to God through him, he's participating with our approach. He's, he's interceding for us, it says. And his intercession isn't trying to get God to remember that he's not mad at us. He's trying to get us to remember that God's not mad at us. He's trying to not get God to remember that he's healed the sick. He's trying to get us to accept that the sick have been healed. He's, he's intercepting. He's, inter, uh, he's, he's uh, intervention. He he's loves to step in. That's why if you give, if when we give our, our, our if we accept the testimony God has given concerning his son and approach God through the son and, and come through the son, we will always start to experience Jesus saying, this is who I am, this is who you are. This is what I've done, this is what you can do. This is where I am, this is where you are. And he'll, he'll, uh, he'll pull us out of the, mo the, 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 the malaise, the, 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 the depression, the discouragement, the sickness, the disease. He'll just start pulling us out. This, and once you start experiencing that, you go, i, I got to spend more time praying because I like being there than here. I like, I like agreeing with him, not me. 
I, I, I'm going to be there. And then you get there, you start realizing God says, hey, why don't you, do, why don't you just lean over there and I'd like you to speak over to China for a few minutes and Xi Jinping, he just, I would like you to declare to him, remind him, would you please, that be wise. I want you to serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling and kiss the sun lest he be angry. You know, I'm just conf conf confessing the scripture. I feel the unction, I do it. And then I return to, wow, amazing what you've done. The whole world is yours. The kingdoms of the whole world are yours. And we shift. We shift. And when the spirit came, it shifted the entire culture of Judaism. So let's stand together. We'll be done. So much more to say. But this high priestly, we're going to go to the coronation. We're not going to have to go to BBC to watch this. We're going to be in, 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 that, in that realm. I mean, for years, it just, it's, we're going to be in that realm. We started with looking up. Let's continue our gaze. We understand that he's been raised from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep him. <laughs> and that will be the true testimony of all of us. There'll come a day when death can't keep us. Death cannot swallow us up. That's why we begin to have no fear of death. That takes a while because my soul is afraid of death all the time. But I have to get out of my soul and into my spirit. Or trust the Lord. And then when it comes to try to avoid death, or do I just go into death, no, God will take me out of it. I've learned it's better to just go in it and come out than to try to avoid it. I, it's so counterintuitive, but he's doing it. But rather than think about death, let's think about the resurrected, glorified Christ seated at the right hand of God the Father. Just begin to gaze. You cannot, you're not creating something other than you're, you're beginning to see what has already been declared. Right at the right hand of God told to sit until his enemies are made his footstool. The Lord and Christ, the one who has received the Holy Spirit and whom poured him out upon all flesh. We rejoice. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you for being so obedient to the Father. You won the world through submission to the Father and trust in his ability and faithfulness. And we'll win the world through submission to you, Lord Jesus, and trust in your faithfulness and ability. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name. We praise you. We praise you right here where we are, where we're living, what's going on, what's happening in our life. There's so much that we don't like and won't, would like to change, but we declare you are Lord of it all and Lord in it all. You are Lord in it all. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the King of Righteousness, King of Peace. Praise you, Lord. See, what we're doing right now is we're activating our place. We're coming up. We're coming up. This is the place of connection, union, communion. Again, let's just say together, Jesus. You're Lord. You're the resurrected King. I believe God raised you from the dead. And I come through you to God. And your intercession saves me, redirects me, recur re recalibrates me to truth in your scripture in the spirit praise you jesus i thank you i praise you father thank you oh praise you thank you for your love your father breath. thank you for your love jesus in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour, pour out, out our praise, praise. It's, it's your, your breath. breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath 
in our love. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. Yes. In our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our let him be in our lives. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. You are. You are. Yes, Lord. Yes, you are. You yes, alone you are. are worthy. This is our inheritance in Christ. This is our privilege to, to approach Him and assured it because of the Scripture, truth, and the Spirit making it manifest. I just feel to release a blessing for us this week. I'm going to receive it. I felt God saying, encourage my people to stay here for the week. Not in this building, but in this place, in the spirit, in truth, agreeing with what we've read, reading it over and over again, meditating on this picture of the high priest, this glorified son of man, seated at the right hand, just however you get there and keep getting there, and keep returning there, and keep responding. Because I have learned that in there, everything resolves. It either resolves that it does not matter, or it resolves that it is changed in its matter. The matter changes. So Lord, I bless. Would you receive that? If you're ready, you're ready to hold, to abide in Christ, in this place, this elevated place of, of that exalted Christ, over this week as we prepare for Pentecost. Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you, I release the blessing. Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of God and you are, have the Holy Spirit to distribute and you are that one who's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. But as, as you wait, the rod of your strength is coming out of Zion to rule in the midst of your enemies. And your people are coming alive in the day of power. So Lord, we now receive the position of a proximity in, this temp, in the throne, in the place of resurrection life, in your place of victory in your place of triumph. We agree with you. We're coming to God through you and we agree with you. And please, please interrupt whenever our thinking's not right. Please take us out of limitations into the, to the glorious triumph of what you've accomplished. Let forgiveness flood our life this week. All the regrets, all the traumas, and all the dramas, we just, we just have to lay it at your feet. And, and, and know that, that, that there's sovereign plans of God over our life that are executed in, by the hands of lawless men, but it's impossible for the death to keep us forever captive because of the life of Christ within. So we say, life of Christ, come. Rise up. Rise up in us. Arise, O oh God. Arise, O oh God. Arise, O oh God. Arise, oh God, let your enemies be scattered. Rise up, O oh Lord, arise, God. Let your enemies be scattered. Let your enemies be scattered. Let your enemies be scattered. Well, Daddy, I just thank you that you are so powerfully capable by Holy Spirit to hold us in this position or return us to this truth and to return us again and again until this truth becomes greater than the realities we're walking through. And the truth of the resurrection and the victory and the life is greater than the trauma and the death and the struggle. 
And so, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we now accept this invitation to come up here, to dwell with you, to abide in this truth and to fellowship. And Lord, I ask you, Jesus, as our high priest, may each of us here and online experience your intercession over our lives. We want to experience your intercession. When you start speaking over our narrative, you start declaring the outcome that's different than the, the fear and the worry we're in. Hallelujah. We welcome your intercession, Lord Jesus. We welcome it. Let us go forth, Lord. Let the night of praise be celebratory. Let it be strong. Let praise erupt in this place. Let it be a real, real, real night of praise and thanksgiving for you. And then Sunday, Lord, let Pentecost come. Let everything that we need, we need a lot. I need a lot. I need a lot of you. And may the parking lot party be a party. And may everybody think we're drunk. And it's not off of tacos or hot sauce. It's because of you. Let the love break out in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.